Well, thanks very much. Thanks for the invitation. And yeah, like the previous speaker, apologies, I'm not joining for very many talks. Teaching is absolutely crazy at the moment uh, for many reasons. But anyway, it's happy to be here. And yeah, I'm going to say a little bit about, well, about a lot of different projects. I want to give credit to three excellent students I've been lucky to have. Andrew Gao, who's still here, Pippa Cole, who just moved to the Grapper Institute, and Sam Young, who's a Humboldt Fellow, plus work by Alex Hall, not associated to me, and who's in Edinburgh. OK, so I'm going to try and tell a very fast, but I hope interesting story of an optimistic take about primordial black holes, a pessimistic take, and then conclude how you sort of meet together between believing primordial black holes explain everything versus primordial black holes are disfavored. OK, so <clears throat> based on the LIGO events, it's unlikely, although certainly disputed, that more than about 1% of the dark matter can be made out of LIGO mass primordial black holes. Of course, you can have many more in different mass ranges, but in the range LIGO sees probably subdominant. But on the other hand, there are no other observational constraints which are tighter. So it's potentially, you know, it's possible that all of the LIGO events are seeing primordial black holes. But how do we know? Well, primordial black holes, or any black holes have no hair, so we can't see the mass. Well, we can see the mass, sorry, we can see the mass ratio of the spin. Um, and then we have to try and deduce indirectly what the formation mechanism was. OK, so. Something which is connected in the positive take is the QCD transition, and this is standard model physics. So in standard model physics, um, using quite recent results from lattice simulations, the equation of state will decrease, um, not by very much, but by about 10 to 20%. And why is that important? Well, uh, the horizon mass at this time is about one solar mass. OK, again, this is a natural scale from standard model physics. Um, now, when the equation of state decreases, the collapse threshold, which Ms. Al spoke about in the last talk, will also decrease because the pressure is reduced. And even though it doesn't decrease dramatically, uh, when it's smaller, you have an exponential enhancement in the formation of primordial black holes. OK, so here's just one example. If you assumed a scale invariant spectrum over some relevant range of masses, which is very different from the the amplitude observed on the CMB scales, then the dashed line shows you what you would get for the mass fraction in primordial black holes. Um, for one particular amplitude, is if this, yeah, if the equation of state was always a third radiation domination, then even when it reduces, omega reduces by about 10 to 20 percent, you see you get an enhancement by about three orders of magnitude in the mass fraction in primordial black holes around one solar mass, and you get a second smaller enhancement in the sort of the LIGO window of 10, say, 30, 40, 50 solar mass black holes. Um, and but, um, I'm sure Juan will talk about this further and how you can extend this also Bernard Carr. Um, OK, now another positive thing is uh, nanograv. They've detected something. They're very careful not to say it's necessarily primordial gravitational waves, but they've seen something. And by coincidence, there's an incredible coincidence, in fact, that the amplitude of the primordial power spectrum that you need to generate primordial black holes shown with the, the solid um, blue or red lines is almost identical to the amplitude you, uh, you, you would need to, do, to explain the PTA signal from nanograv. Now, this, we wrote this paper just shortly before the, the new data release. So we are using the constraint from the, I think it's the 11-year data. Um, but in fact, not much changes with the new data. It just moves from constraint to potential, possibly, detection. The different color lines compare to a, a narrow peak, not a delta function, but a narrow peak in red. And the blue lines are consistently working everything out for a, a broader peak of order unity with uh, the type that Ms. Al spoke about. And I'm advertising this paper partly to show what a, you know, how incredibly close the pulsar timing array constraint is on the primordial power spectrum compared to uh, the PBH value. And um, that also to say that in this paper, which I'm referencing, we, we compared um, the calculation using fresh Schechter theory, using peaks theory, variations of peaks theory, and um, using different window functions. We really put everything together very carefully 
And we showed that the difference in the results, as long as you do everything self-consistently, is around the 10% level, which is about also the level of difference between PTA and primordial black hole. Um, okay, so perhaps there's a fourth coincidence that FPBH equals one really does give the correct merger rate. Now, this is not, I would say, community consensus at all, but um, there's always this question about the disruption. So primordial black holes will form binary pairs in the very early universe before matter radiation equality. And then the question is, do those pairs survive or are they disrupted? And recent work by Karsten Jadamzik um, argues that the disruption rate is about five orders of magnitude and hence FPVH order one may give you the right merger rate. This is not necessarily a contradiction to anything I'm going to show you, because if the FPBH is small, so if there are only a small fraction of dark matter is in primordial black holes, the disruption rate will also be small. So it's possible you can get the right merger rate both for a small value of FPBH and for FPBH order one. And there's many more talks uh, coming up. Sadly, I can't see all of them, but I'll see some of them. Um, so in Karsten's own words, and I know he's giving a talk tomorrow, but unfortunately, while I'm lecturing, he writes that PBH is formed during the QCD epoch and pre or post it, the mass scale of 30 solar mass black holes, the current merger rate, uh, the merger rate of light black holes, and the non-observation of mergers on the fundamental one solar mass scale, so the scale corresponding to the QCD transition. It may be that nature has not chosen this pathway, but if not, it has confronted us with an astonishing coincidence. Okay, so that's, that's sort of the optimistic take. There's a, a lot of different things which line up at the right order of magnitude. Um, but now for something completely different, to move to the more pessimistic viewpoint. Um, here's a quote from a nice article in, um, by Josh Sokol in the Quantum magazine. Uh, which I know some people here are quoted in, um, saying advocates of the primordial black hole hypothesis still have a lot of convincing to do. Most physicists still believe that dark matter is made of an elementary particle, and it's just hard to detect. Moreover, the LIGO black holes aren't too different from what we would expect if they came from ordinary stars. Uh, it sort of fills a hole in the theory that isn't actually there, said Carl Rodriguez. Um, there are things that are weird about some of the LIGO sources, but we can explain everything that we've seen so far through normal stellar evolutionary processes. Um, okay, so that's the other viewpoint, and that's what I looked at with Andrew Gow and Alex Hall, um, was to think, okay, you know, we can fit a model of primordial black holes and you can get the best fit parameters, many people have done that. But let's compare that to the astrophysical model and see if the data by itself prefers one model of the other. So we use a Bayesian evidence. Um, we compare two different models. So you're no longer you know, asking individually what's the best fit for model A or model B. You're asking that and how good is the best fit of model A compared to model B and in what range of parameters is model A a good fit? Um, Okay, so that's the basic idea of a model comparison. Of course, to do this, you have to choose a model. You have to be more specific than primordial black hole. You have to choose a mass function and fit the parameters and choose a prior on those parameters of the model. Um, but we choose various different models, and I'll show you that our results are fairly um, robust. So we choose a, initially a log normal mass function for the primordial black hole model. And then we have to fit the peak mass, uh, the width, and an amplitude, which the amplitude corresponds to the value of FPBH. And we take broad logarithmic priors on the parameters. For the astrophysical model, we're not astrophysicists, so we take empirical models A and B from the LIGO Virgo paper, which capture some of the key physics, such as the mass cutoffs and the power law dependence. Um, you can argue how physically motivated those models are or are not. Um, okay then, so we do that, and in an older work, um, also with John Peacock, we first looked at, well, how, you know, what, what sort of are the key differences between an astrophysical and a primordial model? So for an astrophysical model, for, which is the green line, 
you can see there's a sort of lower mass cutoff and an upper mass cutoff, and they're both quite sharp, uh, modulo the fact that you can have mergers. Whereas for a black, primordial black hole models, you typically get roughly a log normal ish type of shape, which means although you can choose the peak to be in the same position as where LIGO sees it, you can't make it as narrowly cut off. You always get some lighter ones and some heavier ones, partly through critical collapse and partly through the fact that your primordial power spectrum can't just have a delta function, it must have some width to be uh, physically realistic. And we look at both, for example, the total mass and the mass ratio. And you can see astrophysical models can prefer a mass ratio of unity through a dynamical common formation mechanism, while the primordial black holes instead form individually and then form pairs. So it's much more likely you would get mass ratios uh, less than one. And here's just a picture from the new LIGO Virgo results showing that there's a bit of a mass gap between about two and five solar masses and another one above about 50 ish solar masses, except for the second generation black holes, which are formed from a merger. Okay. So, how do they, how do, they do? Well, again, just keeping things simple for the moment, let me just explain sort of the intuition that. If you have a primordial black hole model, what you can do, of course, is you can make it very narrow. You can even make it monochromatic, which is what people used to do. Um, but then you can't fit the full spread of the different masses detected by LIGO Virgo. If you make it broad, the sigma is the, the, the width of the log normal mass function, then you can fit the full range of masses, but there, there can be two issues. Firstly, you would predict very heavy ones which LIGO hasn't seen. And secondly, it's much less likely that the mass ratio will be order unity. And you get quite a flat prior down to values of order 0.1 or so. And there's only really one or two LIGO events which prefer a value of Q much less than one. Um, OK, so now from the new paper, here's just a look at what the the detected number of events would be as a function of the total uh, black hole mass, so m1 plus m2, for the mass ratio and also for a redshift. And you can see, perhaps surprisingly, even though primordial black holes have been merging since the early universe, at the current sensitivity, the redshift is not a good discriminator at all. Uh, the actual detected merger rate will is completely dominated by the detectability of the LIGO Virgo detectors. And so most of them are quite close, but they're not very close to us because the volume very close to us is small. Um, for Q is more promising, and most of the information, in fact, is simply in the mass, either the chirp mass or the total mass. So primordial black holes, they are in a sense more free. You can do more things with them. Um, but if you want to explain all of them, you have some challenges. And that's, of course, what we are going to see from the Bayesian model comparison. So we find best fit values for log FPVH should be, well, minus 2.3. That's log base 10. So that corresponds to FPVH of about 5 times 10 to the minus 3. So about half a percent of all dark matter. Again, this is ignoring disruption things, which uh, Karsten will talk about then the peak of the log normal should be around um, 20 solar masses, maybe 18, and the width, um, I forget now, but it's a void of 0.5 or so. Um, OK, now, many other people, as I said, have done these sorts of fits. But what you don't get out of this information is whether your best fit is also a, actually a good fit. And good fit compared to what? Well, the obvious comparison is good compared to the, the astrophysical stellar models for black holes. OK, so our models, just to be clear, is either all mergers are due to primordial black holes or all are due to stellar black holes. We use the O1 and O2 data. Um, it was hard enough to do that. But of course, we are thinking now about what to do with future data, which was released just a couple of weeks ago. Um, the Bayesian evidence can be approximated as the likelihood of the best fit model times an Occam factor which penalizes wasted uh, prior volume. Both are important, but the Occam factor is 
A, it's obviously prior dependent because how much of your prior volume is a bad fit depends on which prize you chose initially, and that makes it more controversial. Um, but our results are that primordial black holes, again, taking these two models, the extremes are either all black holes or, or all primordial or all stellar, um, disfavors the primordial black hole scenario, both in terms of the Occam factor and in terms of the best fit. And in fact, decisively disfavored, not just a little bit, but really very strongly. And then in the, the Jeffrey scale, this is a decisive disfavoring. Here's a, an idea, I don't have time to go into any details, but this is what's called the posterior predictive distribution. And basically it's something normalized to one, but why what you want your, this PPD to do is to be clustered around where the detected events are and small everywhere else. And so if you just compare LIGO model B, the orange, which you can see has two peaks. It has one where the two light and a tightly constrained masses are, and then a second peak towards the heavier end. And then it also has these fairly sharp cutoffs to lower and heavier masses, whereas the primordial black hole model, um, look at it just at the green line, Okay, you can see it, it does sort of fit. I mean, we made it the best fit, but it, it extends a bit too far to the left and the right. And you can't make a better fit by making it narrower because then you can't capture simultaneously the low and the high mass end. Um, so this gives, I hope, an intuitive picture of what's disfavored about the primordial black hole model. Now we were assuming a log normal mass function and you can ask whether that's actually correct. And the answer is it's actually not very good. If your primordial power spectrum has a very narrow peak and in the unrealistic and physical limit of a direct delta function, then you can see if you compare the true, which is in the red line, to the green line, which is the log normal, you can see the log normal mass function is actually quite a bad fit. And this was a small spin out paper, uh, mainly written by Andrew Gow at, uh, at the same time. So we look at other fits, um, a modified skew normal, skew log normal, et cetera. And uh, this is sort of our physical input then when we say, okay, this wasn't a very good fit, but if you look at LIGO model B, it looks a bit like a bimodal mass function. So how about if you had two peaks in the primordial power spectrum? Okay, you might think that's quite contrived, so do I, but let's just let us you know, play with the, the data as much as we can and play with the model and ask, can we get a good fit if we had two peaks? And the answer is actually still no, because there is a minimum width of the mass function. You know, there's a minimum possible width of the primordial power spectrum. Then with critical collapse, you get a broadening of a primordial black hole mass function. You get two of them, they also interact slightly. And so you get this brown line which you can see it does a bit better than we had before because it, you know, it's a bit more narrowly peaked towards where most of the black hole merger events are, but it's still not a very good fit to the data. We also thought, well, what if we just put in a cutoff by hand? Let's say you can't have any primordial black holes bigger than 50 solar masses. You know, we're being as kind as possible. Unfortunately, that's still a fairly bad fit compared to the astrophysical model. Um, Something we didn't do, but we could in principle, is include the effects of accretion. Um, however, accretion is most efficient for the heaviest primordial black holes. So what that will do is the opposite of our cutoff model. It will increase the number density of heavy primordial black holes while leaving the light tail uh, unchanged. And that's going to make the fit worse, not better. We also think about the disruption, which Juan and um, Karsten and others have spoken about. And again, that doesn't really change things very much. We, you know, we do it, but uh, the best fit is not much better, or in fact, no better than the model where you don't have a lot of disruption. And the problem again is that it's the primordial black hole mass function which dominates the fit and it's never as good as the astrophysical or stellar fit. Um, now, spin is something we had to neglect. Um, there's various new papers. Um, I think we'll see talks about this soon, uh, perhaps by Tony and Juan. Um, 
Of course, that will somewhat favor primordial black holes. And the reason is rather obvious. As Misao mentioned, um, to form a primordial black hole, you don't need the density to collapse by very much because it's already dense enough when it re-enters the horizon. It's a density contrast order one, so it collapses by a factor order one. In contrast, the sun would have to shrink by a factor of a million, which means that you can have a lot more increase um, in the, the spin. Okay. So this would improve things, but not very much because most of the constraining power uh, and the best measured parameters by far from LIGO Virgo are the, are the total mass or the chert mass. It's not, you know, it's not the spin and it's not the mass ratio. The error bars and those other parameters are still quite large and we check that that's true. So we've got this optimistic. Minutes. Okay, thanks. That should be fine. Um, yeah, so I've sort of outlined an optimistic scenario. We've got lots of coincidences all lining up um, versus the pessimistic, the recent work I did with Alex Hall and Andrew Gao. But really, if you think about it, there's no direct or no necessary contradiction. There's no reason why the merging black holes should be all stellar or all primordial. And the primordial black hole merger rates are certainly still rather uncertain. Um, so it's possible that, you know, there are primordial black holes with around FPBH of 10 to the minus 2 or whatever. Um, but it's just that little bit too low to create a significant fraction of the total merger seen by LIGO Virgo. So it's mainly astrophysical plus perhaps a few primordial. That's perfectly allowed. And if you look at this um, chance alignment between pulsar timing array constraints and PBH constraints, that, that won't change very much if you said FPBH is one or 10 to the minus five. You're only logarithmically sensitive. And um, so that's, you know, at that level, things might all be fine. Um, I want to be clear though, if one primordial black hole was detected, it was really would be a transformational thing for the whole field. We would know immediately what some of the dark matter is at the moment we know what one, none of it is. It would be the oldest relic detected, something which formed during the, or close to the QCD transition, so around 10 to the minus five seconds after the Big Bang. And it would tell us something very non-trivial about inflation or defects or something else like that. And a quick, because I just about have time, I'm quickly going to say that if we did detect any primordial black holes with a mass greater than about a millionth of that of the sun, then because they would form a very, very steep density profile and very dense, density profile of the rest of the cold dark matter around them, then it cannot be any sort of standard WIMP or anything which annihilates with a significant annihilation rate because every primordial black hole would have to be a massive, massive signal of very luminous annihilation of whatever the rest of the dark matter is. So if you detect WIMPs, the rest is not primordial black holes. Uh, if you detect primordial black holes, except very light ones, you rule out the rest being a, a fiducial type of WIMP. And the good news is looking forwards, right, there's many new events um, and there's lots, lots more to come. Also the um, Kagura in Japan, uh, LIGO India. So, you know, this is a very exciting field. The pulsar timing array, I'm not claiming they've made any detection, but whatever they have found, um, you know, will they'll firm up whether it's gravitational waves at all. And if yes, whether it's anything to do with primordial gravitational waves. And so lots more work remains to be done, but lots more data is coming. And what I want for Christmas is the detection of a sub chandra Seca mass, because that would really be the transformational thing. So future constraints from things like a Pixie experiment, the square kilometer array, LISA, Einstein telescope, would essentially rule out the possibility that there's any primordial black holes left in the universe today. And here the black hole lines um, which are the nearly scale invariant lines are for zero primordial black holes in the entire observable universe. And you see for most mass ranges that, that can be ruled out within of order two decades. So this is not a story which can go on forever. You know, we will find out one way or the other. So to summarize, primordial black holes could still form all the dark matter, but it's controversial what the upper mass bound is. Um, it's certainly possible that some of the LIGO black holes were primordial, but it cannot be all of them. That's really decisively disfavored. There are some mass gap candidates in the O3 data, so that could be interesting. 
and I think other people will talk about that. Uh, we can constrain the promodal mass, fun mass function and we can also compare it to astrophysical models. And ideally we want to incorporate spin. Um, the detection of any black hole would be transformative and the best smoking gun signature would be a subchandrasaker mass. So I'll leave you with this quote that finding just one black hole of subsolar mass, which should be common uh, in the QCD scenario, um, would transform the entire debate. So let's hope for that in the near future. And I'll finish here. Thank you very much, Dr. Bynes. It's a very interesting uh, summary of this field. Um, we have one comment, which I, I think already clarified by your last, uh, your, your concluding part about the stochastic gravitational detection by the nanograph. So I'll skip mm -hmm. that. There's a question by uh, Karsten uh, Yeramzik. Uh, how is the statement that the PBS mass function uh, cannot be close to a delta function match with the previous talk by Misao Sasaki, where he had a mm -hmm. sharply peaked uh, spectrum? Okay, I, this is my take, Miss I might want to speak, but my take is that we're including the critical collapse. And so the fact that the delta critical is constant for a given profile, but then how much you exceed delta critical will change the mass from the, the primordial black hole mass. So if delta is much bigger than delta critical, you get a black hole mass larger than the horizon mass. If it's very, very slightly above the critical, then you get a a light primordial black hole. Um, now I know that that's um, also to do with, you know, spherical symmetry. There are some questions about exactly how accurate this is, but I don't think there's any contradiction. Uh, yeah, it's quite that... narrow, but at the level of LIGO, when we are really interested in the details and when you've detected multiple different masses, you have to care about this detail. Before LIGO Virgo, you, you know, it was fine to just assume a monochromatic mass function. Professor Saki, do you would you like to make any comment? Oh well, uh, well, not really. I mean, it's, so so in my case, it's it's not on this LIGO Vago range. And when I say monochromatic, actually, there there are. I mean, even before maybe hours or maybe uh, some sometime near what we have done. I mean, some people like uh, you know, I, I think it's I forgot whom. Uh, anyway, the uh, the. Uh, said that even for delta function peak, you may have of the spectrum, you may have some widths, but usually widths is between less than one, say order of magnitude. And this is good enough to be a, a cold monochromatic if you talk about cold dark matter. I mean, primary black holes are cold dark matter. So it's a factor of, you know, plus minus two <laughs> or three. Yeah, so, but in any case, it will be peaked. But uh, for the uh, LIGO Vago range, this factor two matters, right? It's 20 exactly. solar mass and 40 solar mass is different. So, so it's, it's just a matter of how you call it. <laughs> yeah. uh, there's no, yeah, no, no, uh, how to say, a, a, a problems yeah. in that sense. I mean, yeah. So that's my opinion. Okay. Yeah, I uh, Antonio Riolto uh, wanted to ask a question. Yeah. Antonio, go ahead, please. Hi, Chris. Uh, thanks for the nice talk. Oh, so if I, if I understand correctly, so your, uh, your analysis that you presented today is only for the O1 and O2 data, right? So Correct. it does not apply to the, to the big uh, bunch of new data. Because yeah, I, I, kind of I kind of disagree with your comment about the non-importance of accretion, because for the new uh, GWTC2 data, they have, uh, you know, the spin, for instance, is very relevant because they have a bunch of uh, data where the spin is not compatible with zero, like 10 out of uh, 45 or so. Mm -hmm. And uh, their accretion plays a crucial role. Um, otherwise, uh, you, you cannot get uh, relevant accretion, uh, relevant spin without accretion. And also, mm -hmm. it is true that accretion is pushing towards high masses. Yeah. But also one has to take into account that uh, the, you know, the signal to noise ratio for those high masses is larger than the others. So uh, yeah. I will talk about that tomorrow where we, we, we did an analysis very recently. So um, I just wanted to point out that the spin that is, it was in your list of conclusions is very relevant now for the, oh, yeah. for the new bunch of data. And accretion is also relevant. Thanks, thanks. And I don't think I said it was irrelevant. I rather said, I think it will make things worse. I mean, I've just gone back to that slide. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I think I disagree with that statement as well. 
Because, yeah. because, yeah, I think I disagree because going to higher masses, in any case, the signal to noise ratio is higher there, I mean, so far. And also there is a correlation between the higher masses and the, and the higher spins when accretion is accounted for. Okay. So. But the reason why I say it's worse is if you look at our fit, our primordial black hole model fit, and when we, we improve it by adding a cutoff, when we add this M max, it gets better. Yeah, yeah. When we I'm just don't... saying, yeah, right. But I'm just saying that your conclusion bigger makes is even worse because you know a 50 50 or an 80 80 would be even more visible than a 30 30. So yeah, but you have to, is bad. Yeah, right. But then you have to. I mean, now the spin, the spin plays a crucial role, and I don't. I you you didn't idea. include the spin, right? So when yeah. you include the spin, then you then you you need to get a compromise about this kind of effects. This is what I'm just saying. Okay, I, yeah, I, I don't think I disagree apart from I, you know, the reason we didn't do accretion is partly this took months to run, but also because we, once we saw we had a bad fit, we didn't see the motivation with the, with the 102 data. Right, now, I'm, I'm just saying now with the spin, right, you do right. have a motivation, right? That's, yeah. that's my statement. Okay, okay, fine. I accept that. Can, um, I, I, talk. <laughs> can, I, can I ask a naive follow-up yeah. question? Is it clear that uh, primordial black holes, when they are formed, uh, would be non-spinning and only a cushion can spin, spin them up? In radiation domination, yes, because you have a almost homogeneous universe with perturbations of order 10 to the minus two or less. Um, I think that will come in other talks, but... There's no angular momentum in the... Well, it's of order 0.01-ish. So it's very small. If you think of the dimensionless ratio, you know, which is between zero and one or minus one and plus one. So it's very small. Okay. And at the level, you can see the error bars from LIGO, they're still large. That's right, yeah. At that level, you might as well forget it and call it zero. Yeah. I know Tony will talk about O3 data and then it gets a bit more interesting. Okay, thank you very much. And you have to stop this discussion, unfortunately, uh, although it's very, very interesting. So thank you very much.